Welcome to 101 East on Al Jazeera. We are speaking with Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Thanks very much for your time. It's been a long winding road to you finally becoming the Prime Minister of Malaysia. After all the ups and downs, how has it changed you as a person? It's not winding, it's turbulent. <laughs> turbulent, yeah, that's a good way to put it as well. Yeah. But how, how has it changed you as a person? No, you're mature, you, um, you have to remain cool, composed, and do what is right. I'm no longer the opposition leader, and you have to deliver. And uh, it requires a lot of patience. Uh, I'm more tolerant to criticisms, but more important, I'm enjoying was there a point where it was so depressing that you thought this day would never come? Well, with the night I was badly assaulted, I think that point in time, I wasn't thinking about governance or you know, politics. I was thinking of my parents, uh, Aziza and the family. Uh, and I thought because of the severity of the attack, uh, I thought I would not survive. Having gone through all that, has it changed how you make decisions today? Yes, you are more determined to follow through the policies, the principles, the ideals. But at the same time, you are more patient. I mean, after all, whatever decisions you make would be controversial. So, you do what's right. Is it harder for you to trust people now? Well, they say that happens to be my weakness, uh, easily trust people, but I think uh, you, ha you have to be humane, you have to have compassion, um, certainly Even merciful. after all you went through and the betrayals and the alliances that didn't work out? Yeah, but people change. Uh, um, we make mistakes in the past. Why, why impose such harshness on others? But when it comes to governance, I think it is my duty to undertake and affect the change because the country is somewhat destroyed. Unless there is a clear political uh, commitment and resolve to change, I don't believe Malaysia will survive. After Malaysia's 2022 election, Anwar faced an unprecedented hung parliament. His coalition, Pakatan Harapan, or the Alliance of Hope, won the most seats but not enough to form government. Anwar came to power after Harapan signed a pact with minority parties, including bitter rivals Barisan National. Barisan's president, Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, has been appointed deputy prime minister, despite facing corruption charges. Being in coalition with Barisan National, has this partnership caused any problems? Adjustments, yes, because I don't totally have that full independence in appointing. But do it uh, compromise on policies, major policies? No. Although a lot of criticism against Deputy Prime Minister uh, Zahid. But so far, I have not encountered any problem from my team. Some people will say that you have uh, betrayed certain vision and values that you used to hold dear to form this partnership in order to be in power. How would you respond to that? No party. Um, controls the house or having the majority uh, to form the government. The only way out is a coalition. People tend to be more cynical against politicians and they are right because you have seen so many um, inconsistencies in the past. But what is important is the coalition is based on certain core principles. Good governance, a strong stance against corruption, and abuse of power, and have economic policies that could cater for the common man and women. Given that you depend on a very diverse coalition of parties to stay in power, do you think you can still implement the reforms that you promised? The diverse political party, yes. But uh, what is essential, do all of them agree that this country uh, would go to the dogs if we do not take up measures to affect change now. They agree. Do they agree the central problem is the issue of good governance? Yes. Do they agree that corruption has been endemic in this country? Yes. I mean, that's important. And then, of course, we adjust policies. It's not 
I, I'm not a dictator. I mean, I'm a prime minister in a democratic country. Have you found it easier to be an opposition leader, <laughs> to be the proverbial freedom fighter, <laughs> oh. than it is to lead a country? Well, in a way, you are right. Because um, as an opposition leader, you feel, you know, you, no inhibition, you, have, you feel you can just blood it out. I've been fighting corruption all my life. But now, I can make sure that the anti-corruption agencies is more effective, more determined to act against the corrupt. Today, one of Anwar's nemeses, Najib Razak, is in prison. The former prime minister is serving 12 years after being convicted for his role in the 1MDB corruption scandal. But Najib's party is seeking a royal pardon for him. How did you feel when your nemesis and former prime minister Najib Razak was convicted for his role in the 1MDB financial scandal and sentenced to 12 years in jail? My response was you have to respect the rule of law and, and the judicial independence. I mean, personally, of course, you shouldn't rejoice at you know, the suffering of others. I have made sure that the prison authorities give him you know, reasonable uh, protection and facilities, even those who are not accorded to me. You accused him of uh, corruption as well, so you agree with that? You agreed with that sentencing, you felt that it was justified? No, I support the decision of the courts. And I, I believe the courts uh, are independent. And today, with uh, his party, Amno, seeking a royal pardon for him, what kind of message is that sending to you as a coalition partner? Every, you know, when you seek a pardon, it does not mean that you consider yourself innocent. You know, that is the process, and I respect that process. Anyone, any prisoner, any convict, have the right to appeal to the king and seek pardon. Why deny Najib's right? But let the process go. What message is it sending to you as a coalition partner? The fact that they're supposed to be on your side as a unity government, that, but now they've gone ahead to seek a royal pardon for Najib. Is that an offence? Is it against the constitution or the rule of law to seek a pardon for those convicted? It's not. I mean, everybody has the right to appeal. They go through the process. When asked, I happen to be in the board, in the partners board, because by my virtue of being in charge of the um, federal territory. Is there a conflict of interest there then? There's no conflict. I will look at the process. I've read the appeal by the AMNO, and, and um, my response is they have every, every right to appeal. Um, I shouldn't prejudice the case. Have you thought about how that would affect your supporters, how they view you? Why should it affect? Anyone can seek a pardon. Innocent or guilty. We have to look at it professionally and with, with the element of compassion and justice. I mean, these are the principles laid down. It's not even a controversy. Of course, some uh, intellectuals, uh, some political analysts may question who oh, Anwar has been compromised, has compromised. What have I done? I'm just saying that I respect the process. Anwar's coalition and the opposition are preparing for six upcoming state elections. Each side currently controls three states. In the lead-up to the polls, the opposition claims it is being persecuted by Anwar following corruption charges laid against its leaders. Your opponents are talking about taking over the government even before the next GE. What's your take on that? There will be some minority forces, but if they are, have to face uh, the courts in the corruption trial, what choice do they have? They will try and unseat, hopefully to save themselves. Uh, but there is no indication, no serious challenge until now. We got the two-third majority. What do you think is the greatest challenge to your government's stability today? For now, it is very stable. We have two-third majority. What else do you uh, expect? the opposition to do. Um, some are very jittery because of my strong stance against corruption and abuse of power. Always this rumour comes about when people swing sides, changing sides. It doesn't bother me. They misread. If they think that I'm a bit rattled, no. Some of the most corrupt forces, you know, 
the political elite in this country are ganging up naturally with the billions at their disposal. Uh, but uh, now that I'm in power in the position, I'm not sitting idle. So I will fight them if they, uh, you know, um, want to solicit support by buying people, by bribing people, and to protect their turf. Your opponents say that you're just witch hunting. You're trying to weaken them, maybe before the state elections, which is a platform that they plan to use to show that they still have the support of the people. What's your response to that? If you're corrupt, look at the facts and the law. If you've taken money from companies or contractors that you award the tender and in return give you the money and your party the funds, you have to explain. There's nothing personal about it. What we're chanting. I did not mention the opposition to the Anti-Corruption Commission. I said no one should be spared. If the opposition does well in the state elections, is there any concern over them pushing for a vote of no confidence? They are not members of parliament. They can come to the uh, parliament and take a vote. They can put some pressure, but it will not uh, in any way affect the position of the federal government. Malaysia is an ethnically diverse country. Malay Muslims make up nearly 60% of citizens and are granted special status in the constitution along with other indigenous people. The rest are ethnic Chinese, Indians and other minority groups. Anwar has long promised equal rights for all, but it's a divisive issue in a country where politicians exploit race and religion to win votes. You're the first Prime Minister from a multiracial party in Malaysia. Does that mean that there's hope of Malaysia moving away from race-based politics and race-based parties? It is up to us in the present government to prove a case that uh, the future for this country is a multiracial uh, agenda. There are concerns about the issue of poverty over the Malays, but the solution is not race-based. Poverty is just poverty. The vast majority are Malays, but there are pockets among the ethnic Indians and a small number of Chinese. I would not uh, you know, profile them according to race, but profile them according to their earnings. So you're committed to move on from the uh, affirmative action based on race to, to make it based on needs? Yeah, I mean, very is clear. Still, is that still yes, a priority? Yes, of course. This uh, approach would help the Malays more than the race-based policies, because the race-based policies have been proven uh, to be used by the few elites and their cronies to benefit themselves. Anwar's opponents are an alliance of conservative Malay Muslim parties strident about communal politics. The upcoming state polls will show if Anwar can strengthen his Malay support base and stem the rise of conservative Islam. As a politician, you were known to be someone pushing for reform values. You espoused equal rights for all races and religion. Now, the constitution protects the special position of Malays and Islam. That runs contrary to the idea of genuine equality for all races and for everyone. So how do you go about actually implementing policies that are fair for all? You swear as President of the United States on the Bible. Does it mean that therefore you disallow those who believe in the Qur'an. I mean, there's a system, you accept it as a reality. What is forbidden is, of course, to use that to discriminate and undermine the rest. I'm blessed to be a practicing Muslim. I, I fast, I pray, but why must it be seen to be divisive? Unless you take up policies or in your rhetoric, you continue to abuse or discriminate, which I will not do. And this administration, we made it very clear, we protect the sanctity of our belief, our religion, but we are Malaysians. And how do you apply it in, by way of policies, though? It's, the devil is in the details. Even your opponents talk about the inclusivity. So how do you apply it? Inclusivity by a Malay party who talks about Malay policies and, um, and use every occasion to attack 
us as being multiracial and liberal to the rest. That's not inclusivity, that's hypocrisy. Our inclusivity, which means, okay, I go and pray in the mosque. Does it contradict? No. I say, you want to pray in the church, you should have all the freedom. What's the difference between your approach to Islam compared to that of your political opponents? It, it has been there for a thousand years between um, the uh, more extreme fanatics. Uh, I'm not calling all of them extreme and fanatics. Some are quite reasonable. But I'm thinking the trend is worrying. One of your ministers tried to have a youth program whereby people of different faiths visit other places of worship. And that wasn't taken very well. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of backlash by Islamic authorities. And that program is now canned. What is your take on well, that? program is not, not necessarily a wise program. Why do you go and excite people unnecessarily? At the time when people are a bit apprehensive, huh? yeah. not only in Malaysia, worse in the Europe these days. I think we should be more circumspect to uh, not allow issues like this to be abused or used, exploited by the opposition who are desperate. People are worried about the growth of conservative Islam in Malaysia. Why do you think that's the case? And what can be done about it? It is a quite universal phenomenon in most Muslim countries. I think we should address it with reason. We should be a bit forthright in this. I'm countering many of their arguments, even in Parliament. If you transgress issues like using a racial card, a religious card, to divide people, will go hard against you. The need to connect with Malaysia's young is vital for Anwar. Half the voters nationwide are below 40 years old. Baby, I go out of tight. TikTok was a key battleground in the 2022 election, with the opposition and their supporters churning out viral videos. After more than two decades, is Anwar's battle cry of reformacy still relevant to youth today? You know, your calls for reformacy was very much a part of your political career, but when we talk to some of the younger people, it doesn't resonate with them. How would you try to gain ground with that crowd? We have the, the means to disseminate the information and get to understand. But I don't want them to understand history. They should understand reform and the imperative for reform because of the uh, urgency and the necessity now to implement and to affect change. My message to them, as I uh, felt when I was young, we have a role. Do your best. Save this country and seek the truth. What kind of legacy do you hope to leave behind as a Prime Minister? My old teacher used to tell me, do what is right and do your best. And then he continued laughingly and said, and them the rest. So I said, I'm going to exclude that part. I'm just saying, do what is right and do your best. And let it, the future, que sera, sera. Well, that's all the time we have. Thanks very much for your time, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Thank you. It's a pleasure. A pleasure. Thank you.